So I want to um, introduce our, our plenary speaker for um, this last session of today. Um, he's Jun Yu, who um, actually I've known for many years. Uh, he taught here at the University of Arizona um, for quite a few years, longer than I've been here. Um, started out as an assistant professor, became associate, then full professor, then head of the English department. He, of course, was also in, um, in the SLAT program, one of the uh, very, um, very popular teachers and advisors and mentors of students in the program. Uh, and uh, was here at the university until July 1st of, this, of, of 2011. He then uh, was wooed away <laughs> by Georgia State University to be Associate Provost for International Initiatives, Chief International Officer, and Professor of Applied Linguistics. Um, you have on page 26 in the program a lot of information about him and about his talk, so I won't do a lot of, of um, reading through that. You can do that yourself. Uh, but I wanted to mention two things. One is the Confucius Institute of the University of Arizona. He is the one who, of course, set that up here, got, got um, the Confucius Institute for the university, and uh, was in charge of it um, until, he, until he left. Uh, and we're very grateful that he um, brought that institute here. Um, it's been a very good addition to the university. Um, and of course, he was past president of TESOL, uh, and um, I think really uh, when all, I remember the year he was president, he was going all over the world to give talks and um, really bring TESOL to uh, many, many different um, groups in the world. And of course, uh, since he was at, at the university here, um, it gave us a lot of visibility too. Uh, he. Um, is a wonderful speaker. He, he spoke also at our last conference, and I, a lot of us were reminiscing about the talk. And um, so we're really happy that he's um, back again um, to give us a talk today on intercultural incompetence, <laughs> the top challenge of Chinese guest teachers in the US schools. June. Thank you very much, Lynn. It's truly a great pleasure for me to be back to the university where I spent 13 years, starting from 1998 to 2011. Yesterday, I, uh, uh, one of my uh, doctoral students, Kara Johnson, defended her dissertation on peer response in the Chinese classroom in Nanjing. So I'd like to recognize Kara to be Dr. Johnson. I know sitting among you are lots of my colleagues, former colleagues and now also friends and uh, former students and uh, also international friends and colleagues. A minute ago, Jane Jackson from Chinese, Hong Kong University, uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong came to say hello. And Jane was the one who tried to recruit me in 1996 to Chinese University of Hong Kong. And I have to assure you, I'm still very interested <laughs> Maybe one day I will return to Asia. And also, a uh, very good friend and colleague, my former dean, uh, my former dean, but now still current dean, Dr. Mary Will Dabasa, uh, who I am glad not to report to now. <laughs> and uh, I thank her for releasing me from uh, U of A. But we enjoyed uh, working together very much. And Lynn Wall, uh, the long time uh, SLAT director, a great colleague and friend uh, who is now taking charge of ELL directorship. And of course, I cannot name all of you, but I'm just so glad to be back because of the weather, <laughs> because of this very conference. It has elevated over the years due to the great effort of the directors and the participating faculty and the students. So it is now truly international conference, and I'm glad to be part of it. Some of you asked me how I think about Georgia, 
Georgia State University. I've just been there for less than a year, less than half a year. But I have to say that I enjoyed uh, the, what I'm doing, basically in charge of the university's international initiatives. Over the last five months, I started with uh, a silver uh, medallion of Delta to Diamond Delta, and covered 125,000 miles around uh, four countries uh, last semester. I traveled to West Africa, Cote d'Ivoire. I traveled to South Africa, Colombia, Taiwan, China, uh, China twice, by the way. And uh, so I'm going to Brazil uh, very soon. So I feel uh, very excited about doing those kind of things. So I want to be known not as a Chinese who can only do business in China, but around the world. So that was a suspicion one of my committee members asked. Jun is good in doing business in China. What about other countries? Then I want to prove, yes, I can do that. So today's topic is out of a research I did a couple of years ago uh, about guest teachers in, uh, in the United States. And I want to share with you, uh, as all of you know, that uh, uh, right now with the recent rise of the prominence of the global state, China has begun to claim a major share of the international spotlight. Many of you uh, know that uh, there are lots of activities, business, education-wide, they are all trying to collaborate with China, uh, among other countries. Accompanying this growth in the world attention, the Chinese language has rightfully been viewed as a vital tool of understanding and networking with Chinese individuals, institutions, and enterprises. About five years ago, uh, there was a talk about uh, the network like Ariane Francais or Godet and uh, Institute. So the uh, Chinese government has set up an entity called Hanban, which I will explain a little bit later. But the enormously practical value of learning Chinese has accordingly begun to be grasped by national governments and the ministries of education, global business, and private citizens. For this very reason, there is an urgent need to train an unprecedented number of Chinese student, uh, teachers to meet the growing and diverse demands of the world's Chinese language learners. So Chinese government, uh, in order to answer or uh, respond to the emerging needs, has set up an office or entity which is directly uh, affiliated with Ministry of Education called Hanban, the Office of Chinese Language International. And along with that, there is a concrete entity called Confucius Institute, headquartered in Beijing. And nowadays, there are about 358 Confucius Institutes around the world. U.S. alone, uh, we have reached more than 60 Confucius Institutes. And our Confucius Institute at the University of Arizona uh, became one of the uh, top 50, uh, 50 or 52 or 53 in 2008. But now, Chinese government want to collaborate with more elite university, including uh, Berkeley, including University of Michigan, and the University of Chicago. So uh, there are more than 50 uh, or 60 Confucius Institute. Each institute, Confucius Institute, is doing different things focusing on language teaching, cultural exchange, uh, international business, etc. So uh, this is, uh, my talk is focused on one of the initiatives, the Hanban, to train guest teachers to teach in U.S. K-12 through schools. So among the critical initiatives, Hanban has developed a comprehensive series of systematic and scientific standards for teaching Chinese, so I was brought in as an advisor in 2007 to discuss about the major benchmarks we have to set for this field. So three standards came out of discussion over the next two years of labor. One is called Standards for Teachers of Chinese to Speakers of Other Languages. In 2007, I was, uh, I was president of TESOL. So they brought me in, and uh, the first thing I did was to coin the word Texel. So even though there is no copyright, but I did uh, 
introduced this word called Texo. Now it becomes an icon in the field. The Columbia University of Columbia has this program, MA program. Lots of doctoral programs, dual degree programs come out of this acronym. And there are more than 64 MA degree, professional degree programs of Texo in China. Teachers of Chinese to speakers of other languages. The second is Chinese language proficiency scales and speakers of other languages. Basically, this is a learning uh, benchmark, just like ACT4 you know, guideline uh, for the uh, 0 to 10. And then the inter, uh, national curriculum for Chinese language education. So it's a curriculum standards. So these three standards were produced out of many meetings and, <clears throat> and hard labor over the uh, in a couple of years. So today I'm going to focus on one of them, that is the teacher standards. So TESO, TEXO standards in both its scope and content draw heavily from most recent research on second language acquisition and teacher methodology, as well as from a wide range of practical teaching experience gained from instructors in all teaching contexts and with learners at all proficiency levels. Uh, my own interest in teaching Chinese to speakers of other languages also started in 2007, and previously I have been predominantly working for teaching English to speakers of other languages. One of the beauties is that TESO is far advanced than TEXO. TEXO is still at its infant stage. So lots of the things we have done in TESO can be transferred to TEXO. But there are certain things that can, is not transferable. That is the topic of today, so I'd like to talk about intercultural communication competence or incompetence. There are five domains in these standards, and I still use the Olympic symbol. Huan Huan Ying Ying, Bei Bei Jing Jing, okay. The language abilities and the skills, this refers to not only language skills uh, and ability in Chinese, but also English as an international language. Because if you recruit teachers from China to teach Chinese in U.S., they must be able to speak English. Otherwise, they are going to fail. And because of this requirement, we have not selected the best teachers because we, the sole criteria is their English proficiency. So when these teachers come, they also encounter lots of difficulties. The second is culture and communication. This is by far one of the most important areas, but this is also a most neglected area because we don't know how to train teachers to have multilingual competence or intercultural competence. Second language acquisition and learning strategies is very important, and teacher methodology, of course, is a core of teacher standards, and last but not least, the professionalism. They have to be willing and devoted to this profession. They have to uh, be ready psychologically to uh, meet with the challenges in a different world, uh, part of the world. So these are the five, and then they are they can be subdivided into 10 standards. Sorry, it's too quick. And the different color means different modules, five modules and the 10 standards. And TEXO is meant to be a benchmark for teacher knowledge, abilities, and skills in teaching Chinese as a second foreign language. Given highly varied teaching context, mixed teaching levels, diverse student needs, different teaching objectives, a number of context-specific vari variations will be subsequently be developed based upon text or domains and the standards. So, what makes a competent guest teacher in the U.S.? Once we, we develop the standards, try to implement in the language teaching, and we send teachers receiving training to the U.S., lots of problems occur. And some of them had to stop in the middle of their term and uh, were sent back. Some of them cry every night, uh, missing their parents and siblings. And some of them simply cannot communicate with students. When they see students not sitting, facing teachers, you know, with their hands down, they just feel it's chaotic. They cannot deal with that. So there are lots of issues, not only related to language, but also the classroom management and the cultural issues. So well. What should we do? So in practice, it's very difficult. Uh, in China, uh, <clears throat> predominantly, uh, Chinese is taught as a, foreign, a second language in China. So China, uh, many universities in China attract lots of foreign students to study abroad in China. And in a year or two, these students have a prof high proficiency because of the environment. 
but teaching Chinese abroad in US or in Thailand or in other contexts is relatively new. So by using the textbooks, the methods of teaching Chinese in China in other contexts becomes a problem. So context is very important. And also another difficult thing is that uh, level specific training. So lots of teachers are sent here to teach kids, elementary school kids. And you know that the, the, the class period sometimes is challenging. So if you want to teach 45 minutes to six year old, seven year old kid, it's too much. So they try to shorten it to 20 minutes each because of the short attention span. And then of course, performance indicators, what it means to be a good teacher. So they have to have abilities to solve problems, to analyze cases, and also design instructional tasks. Even though there are more than 1,000 textbooks out there, hardly any fits this context because they were designed by native speakers in China for students to learn Chinese in China. So it's totally different. That, you know, of course, we all understand the language context plays a different role. All right, so because of this one, the, I was charged to do a field work or study to resolve this issue, what can we do to find out the challenges and difficulties these Chinese guest teachers face in U.S. schools? There are two partners uh, in U.S. Uh, with Confucius Institute. One is uh, College Board. So they are working diligently to uh, oversee lots of teacher selection, supervision, and a curriculum. The other is Asia Society in New York. They are also key partner to work with, uh, with the Chinese uh, uh, Hanban. So in order to do that, uh, I conducted a study in 2000, uh, uh, 2010, from March, January to March. So the objectives uh, I will specify later is to really to understand what's going on, what kind of things that need our attention. How can we build into a teacher training to help prevent those things happen? Once they're you know, uh, in schools, what kind of supervision, support can we provide for these teachers? And uh, uh, I tried to, uh, first I did a survey among all the guest teachers in the United States, and then based upon the key findings, I tried to follow up with interviews and uh, school visits. So I selected the three states. They all start with O. Can you guess? Ohio, yes. Ohio is, uh, is considered one of the primary uh, sites because of Ohio State University Chinese program, and also the school board is uh, very supportive. So in Cleveland, Columbus, and Cincinnati. And the second O is Oregon, yes. Uh, Portland, Oregon. And uh, they, uh, President Wu Jintao just visited them last year, and they are doing a great job. And also they have Nike, right? And lots of companies doing uh, business Chinese. And the third O is Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, Norm, uh, Norman, and uh, so lots of teachers. Uh, are sent to those states, and also in Utah, Kentucky, Connecticut, are all the heavily uh, situated for, uh, to accept Chinese to, uh, teachers. So I visited those three states and interviewed, observed the classes, interviewed teachers, interviewed principals, colleagues, and most importantly, interviewed host families, because a lot of intercultural issues occur in their daily uh, life and with with the school uh, colleagues, in particular with, uh, with the hosts. So this is one of the scenes in Ohio, in Cleveland, Shaker High, and uh, you know that uh, th this is one of the teachers. She eventually, I think she got award in one of the conferences. She was very animated in classroom, well received by her students. And this is again, so that is the situation. And when you deal with, uh, when you teach a class of students, how can you sustain their interest, motivation? And what happened to some of the schools is that they, uh, they were asked students to select one of the two foreign languages, one is Spanish, one is Chinese. And in the end, they find it's very difficult because they want to learn both. So one semester they teach Chinese, the second semester teach Spanish. By the time they do it again, those who learn Chinese forget everything. We'll read the video. So they are experimenting. They don't have a particular curriculum. They are not sure. They all want to learn Chinese, but what is the exact outcome can we expect? So these are some of the pictures. So field work is to understand the challenges, difficulties of guest teachers, 
and to understand Chinese teaching uh, programs, curriculum, teaching materials, what are working, what are not. And the third is to understand uh, the school administrator's perspective regarding their Chinese programs and to understand the perspect uh, perspectives and issues of the host families and to make recommendations for teacher training. So these are the objectives. And uh, since this is already 550, right, 545, so I'm, I'm using Chinese to wake you up, okay? <laughs> Just in case you, 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 uh, you cannot, but I will highlight in English, so don't worry. You don't have to understand it. But you know this bar here uh, means all the Chinese teachers sent to the United States, almost 50%, half of them are teaching in high schools. So senior high schools. So this is the majority uh, teaching uh, level, high school. And uh, some of them are teaching multiple levels. Like last one, 13.51. They teach not only high school, but a junior school. They teach in multiple sites. So uh, because uh, of the varied interest of school districts. So this is the distribution. This means that uh, their major responsibility of teachers, according to themselves, is teaching, uh, writing curriculum, uh, coming up with teaching materials, and also organize activities. And uh, what do they think they should uh, have or in terms of the, the conditions or the responsibility? And the first is that they need classroom management skills. They need to have uh, good cultural communication skills, and they need to have a good uh, psychological readiness to deal with challenges, difficulties, etc. And uh, uh, these are some of the... <laughs> but I want to point out number two. They need to be able to drive. Okay. Because you, this is something you will never expect. That when they come here, they have to teach in different schools. They have time limit. So many teachers are frustrated because they cannot drive. They don't know how to drive. So this is something, it's beyond the teacher training, but it's a skill. And they have to learn how to cook because they miss Chinese food and they cannot find a Chinese restaurant. What can they do? So these are all the essential skills we need to build into our training so, that, so those teachers will feel more comfortable. That will directly affect their teacher. I think I have more Chinese. Don't, don't worry. So I hope, what kind of training do you want? I, Again, the three, three aspects, the classroom management, teaching methodology, and cross-cultural communication skills. And the others you know, include many things we don't want to name, but one of them is also related to the cultural uh, training in cultural understanding. OK, I, I don't think you even need to know that. And, uh, let me skip over too much. This is too much. All right. Now, this is the finding. So I'm going to summarize major findings. Then I will focus on intercultural communication. I will show you some cases I interviewed to see what are some of the problems, let you figure out what exactly uh, they are. So the study reveals that the top three challenges for guest teachers from China are intercultural communication, incompetence, competence, classroom management, and teaching methodology. Classroom man management is related to their own experience of learning English in China and their expectation and how they learned English in China. But here, it's different. So that is a huge issue. And no matter what you do in China, you cannot provide enough information. So you need to really have a part arrival training as a component and ask those teachers to observe some classes in order to be able to feel what they can do, they should do. And teaching methodology, of course, is different uh, in US and then in China. The second is single most frustrating factor that has caused much concern by school administrators uh, has, and has impacted the sustainability of the Chinese guest teacher program in case of 12 schools in US is the length of stay of the guest teachers. By the time they feel comfortable, they are sent, sent back. So usually one year and it's really not long enough. There is a lot of tremendous waste of you know, human resources. But if they stay here longer than one year, two years, what about their visa status? What about some of them want to stay here longer, even longer? So these are all the issues. And their home schools or universities might not be happy 
to you know, send them away for too long. So this is a frustration we yet need to resolve. Number three is homestay or host family is a great idea to support guest teachers for acculturation. But a serious problems occur due to the lack of information and two-way interaction. What they are told is different what, than what they experience. When those kind of conflicts occur, some of them are able to handle, some of them cannot. And if they cannot handle, what are the consequences? I'm going to use a few cases later on. And because many schools are at the initial stage of experimenting with Chinese language programs in the foreign language curricula, there lacks a comprehensive multi-level and multi-layered curricula for Chinese language at and across elementary, middle school, and high schools. It seems wherever you start, you always learn basic Chinese. Ni hao, zai jian, xie xie. And when you are at high school, you still learn those kind of things. There is lack of articulation in the curricula. And also, beyond the threshold level, really we don't know what are the core vocabulary students have to learn. Whether, when to introduce the writing system. These are all the pedagogical issues that need to be reflected in the curriculum. Number five, there lacks effective and efficient teacher training programs for guest teachers. Uh, last year we had a program in UCLA, the previous few years we had it at Stanford and organized, coordinated by some of the uh, supervisors or, or, or foreign languages in some uh, states. And uh, the combination of uh, before arrival and upon arrival training might uh, make more sense. And also the way to train should be different. We should have more cases, more videos, and more demos to help uh, those teach prospective teachers to gain experience. The lack of coordination and a transition between and among teachers, uh, teachers and the schools, and the many schools are at their initial stage in offering Chinese courses. So this is a time that we really need to take a close look at the old issues, including the curriculum, teaching materials, teaching hours, learning objectives, and teacher profile, teacher uh, training. So before I talk about recommendation, let me show you some cases. I avoid showing you because they are, they are all transcribed in Chinese. When I interview these uh, teachers, I feel more comfortable interviewing in Chinese because I want to make them comfortable. But if they initiate in English, I will use English. So I have one stack of data from Chinese, one for English. I just want to focus on one particular person. Uh, she worked in the Tulsa school district. and. Uh, uh, the reason for her to come is uh, uh, she just on the, one day she chatted with her friends saying that uh, there is a great market, you know, a great opportunity uh, for teachers to, uh, to teach in the United States. She got interested and she applied and she got admitted, uh, she got uh, accepted. So she went to the Oklahoma school district. Uh, over the period of six months, she changed uh, three host uh, host families, and the longest duration is three months. The shortest is one month and a half. And this is what happened. The first uh, host family uh, was so engaged with work, and they don't have time for her. So she expected to talk with the host every day. But she couldn't find the time, and she said, she, I couldn't deal with it. So that was pretty simple. I'm not going to elaborate on that. And the second family looked for her, tried to find someone uh, like her. Her name, uh, Le Yi, is a Chinese name, but we'll give him just uh, Li. Okay, it's easy to remember. And uh, one of the, the uh, occasion, according to her, I tried to get two perspectives. One is the host, uh, hostess, uh, another is a... Uh, herself, and she said basically that there were many, many occasions. One occasion that uh, because uh, uh, the host, host is, is a single woman and she has her own habits, so she just made, made an agreement with her that every day she has to uh, take shower before 8 o'clock in the evening. And every Saturday she has to do her laundry because Sunday uh, the hostess wants to do her own laundry. So on one occasion, uh, she had a, a, a trip with her colleagues outside. She returned after 8, 
and the host was not at home. She was supposed to return on Sunday, so she started laundry. And then in the middle of the night, at nine something, that she came back and she burst into temper, you know, temper, and just said simply, "How come that you did not listen to what I said?" So this is her version of the conflict. But her hostess, on the other hand, offered a different version. So it's a two, twice told tale. And uh, her host, hostess just believed that because you know she should have, she could have done it, but she should just let her know ahead of time so that uh, she would not, you know, be doing it at an inconvenient time. So there are lots of occasions like that. So in the end, that uh, the hostess uh, decided to let her go. So report to the school principal, and school principal had to find somewhere else. Just at that time, another family wanted to accept her. So this is truly an issue. So I want to read the quote of that family. So I, I interviewed the host family, uh, husband and wife. And this is what the, uh, the husband's name is Terry, and the wife's name is Grace. So Grace just said, uh, we realize that she is the youngest one in the family, and she probably used to family to do everything for her. So we kind of take that into consideration and let her know that over here you have to be responsible for yourself. Take it for yourself. We do things for you to help you at the beginning. It will make you familiarize with everything. Get you feel comfortable and then slowly she needs to learn to take more responsibilities. And it, which is echoed by the husband. Basically they uh, complain that uh, she relies too much on what uh, on the host family. One of the concrete uh, example is that uh, she always complained that she's hungry and she wants to eat, but because uh, the hostess uh, has, has a very different, odd schedule, she has to go to work at 3 o'clock in the morning because of her job. So uh, uh, when she returns, the host returns, she's tired. She cannot cook for the kids until after she takes a nap. But Lei has a different schedule. So they are kind of uh, wondering what to cook and... Uh, and uh, when she cooks, she does not clean. And according to her husband, that uh, she has to take responsibility to clean up after she cook, cooks. And also, uh, she expects them to go to Chinese grocery every week, while the family, having three kids, usually go to uh, Chinese grocery or Asian market once a month. And the wife is from Malaysia, the husband is uh, American. So they try to use a comparison of the previous uh, a student they hosted from Japan, who, according to them, uh, uh, gets along well with the family, goes to the kids' uh, football uh, training, piano lessons, so she is accepted as part of the family. But this particular teacher is not accepted, and there are many, many conflicts. Let me read a couple more quotes. Okay, so here, uh, this is something that uh, the husband feels that uh, uh, it's not appropriate or something uh, he is not happy with. I think one of the big negatives about this, uh, this teacher is that she talks to her parents on the internet every day. She talks to her family at home every day, and I think that's bad because it makes her homesick because when the student was here, she called her mom once in a week, and you know that not so much because she was busy in her study, but with this person, she calls her family every day, sometimes at 4 o'clock in the morning, and that's why she does not have enough uh, energy when she goes to work, and that was reported by the school principal. School pr principal believed that she always feel, you know, tired when she teaches classes. And for, from her tale, she said, because I don't have anyone to talk with, I have to rely on my family, in China through internet. And then that created another crash because the, they don't have wireless internet. They have to use one computer in the room, which is always occupied by the husband. So those kind of things created lots of problems and uh, eventually cannot be resolved. And I think uh, getting close to family, talking every day, is something many Chinese students do, especially when they are young. But here, it's not considered as highly risk, kind of independent behavior or something. So you just need to uh, ha uh, understand that they have different tales. And that because of those kind of things, uh, lots of uh, uh, 
intercultural, you know, clash occur. And I have lots of examples, but I will refrain from further illustrating. I will answer questions later. So let's focus. Uh, yes, we have about 10 minutes. So what does it mean that uh, when we train Chinese teachers in China, solely relying on resources from Chinese professors or experienced teachers, not enough? We are talking about training teachers to teach in a different context. But solely relying on US professors or trainers is not enough either, because they will ignore some of the perspectives coming from the prospective teachers themselves. So as a result of those kind of conflicts, I uh, have tend to make the following recommendations. Some of them is directly related to intercultural communication incompetence. So revise the textual standards and make it more practical. So we try to have everything there, 10 standards, but in reality, that doesn't work very well. So revise the textual standards to make it more practical. While you're focusing on the training of intercultural competence, classroom management skills, and the teacher methods. So we try to have more, uh, weight, more weight to uh, intercultural communication by using case analysis. One of the things we did is to have those prospective teachers to keep a log of all the cases, challenges they encounter in different pockets, with school, with host family, with students, and then they, they will uh, finish all the cases. And all these cases can be selected and recategorized and be used for teacher training. So that seems to be very effective. The second is develop a comprehensive and multi-level four-pronged teacher training program that includes prior training, upon rival training, on-site orientation, and ongoing supervision. The last point is missing, because once the teachers are here, they're just thrown into the classroom. No one is supervising them. So this is very important, and we need to provide a support network. So whatever issues they have, they will have someone to talk with to get supervised right there through internet or through uh, real people in the different school districts. Develop a teacher training program, design and develop training manuals, and develop a multi-layered database for cases of guest teachers. So this is happening. Number six, create a pool of experts and experienced teachers. So when those teachers return to China, you know what they do? Many of them go back to teach English. And so there is a waste of expertise. And these teachers should be empowered to train the future teachers, or at least as a cultural informant, or as someone who can relay the, the materials. So this is something I recommend they should, uh, Hanban should, should do. Establish Hanban Agency, a center for office in some countries or continents. And I'm glad that College Board has an office for Hanban relations. Uh, in New York, and help develop country-specific Chinese language curricula to be aligned with teach textbooks and supplementary materials. So this curricula is very important, and uh, the purpose of teaching Chinese is not to uh, have all, everyone speak fluent Chinese. The purpose of teaching Chinese is to give them some kind of you know taste of uh, Chinese, so those who are highly motivated will be able to select and uh, learn even further. So otherwise, you will be disappointed. And, and uh, strengthen the guest teacher program by improving the screening process for the guest teachers. So when college board uh, select Chinese teachers in China, they should not only focus on language English proficiency. And they should have local teachers to be teamed up with those foreign teachers to select based upon their readiness uh, their sense of intercultural communication skills, give them examples of uh, problems to solve, really understand whether they are able to deal with challenges and difficulties. So language proficiency itself is not enough. More coordination is needed along lo uh, among local organizations, school districts, and Hanban. So this is, uh, these are the 10 recommendations. And uh, as a result, 10 standards are now condensed into five standards, and one of them is the culture, Chinese culture and intercultural communication. 
This is very important, and we put more emphasis on this in this component. And as a result, then each standard has a, some sub-standards, which I won't go into detail. But I want to show you. This is three, standard four, five. OK. So what is interesting, which is something uh, we might not really agree, is that for each module, for each standard, we have designed the, the courses. Each course has been given certain uh, hours, credits. So when students uh, or future teachers apply uh, to teach abroad, they have to receive a certificate. And this certificate will require each teacher, prospective teacher, to receive training in four, five modules. And this is the distribution of hours they should uh, spend on those modules. So this is a rough. It's not uh, formally published yet, but it's a work I want to share with you that in order to raise, uh, uh, in order to uh, ensure the quality of the future guest teachers, they need to receive more training. Some of this training will be done here upon arrival. Some will be uh, there before they leave the country. So this is a course, and each course, of course, will have a training module. That's it. We got we love Chinese, and uh, I. Uh, this is a picture in Oklahoma. So when we took that picture, that teacher was not convinced. She was a little bit suspicious. Are you going to really speak Chinese? But look at those kids, and they are the hope, the future. They really, they just came to me every few seconds. Ni hao, ni hao. How are you? So when I walk from here, there at least uh, you know, fifteen kids want want to shake hands with me. Ni hao. And I say, ni hao. So kids are very enthusiastic. But if we don't do a good job, they are going to lose their motivation soon. Because Chinese, after all, is not easy to learn, I have to admit. But there are lots of success stories, and especially teaching children. So this is so important. That's why we really need to train good teachers. And one of the top uh, uh, criteria is making sure that these teachers have a sense of intercultural communication and a skill, strategy to deal with difficulties, to learn from others through cases, and also to forge a support group. And uh, so in the end, I want to say that when I use this title, intercultural communicative, uh, intercultural incompetence, I want to relate to a talk I gave at Circle two years ago. What I mean is that if you don't understand your students, you shouldn't blame them for their incompetence. You should think about your own incompetence to understand their incompetence. You have to think from their perspective, why is it you don't understand them? If you know, if you have the knowledge of their cultural background and the language, you probably will understand them better. So before you complain or blame those st students who are unable to communicate, you have to think what you can do to make their communication more effective. And that is incompetence is not by one party. So incompetence is by both. And only realizing your own incompetence of understanding students' incompetence can you empower your students to be competent because you are competent. Thank you. So we, we have uh, some time for question and answer. A very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Um, I have lots of questions I can ask, and maybe I'll try to catch you somewhere in, well, in Georgia before you take off somewhere else. I'll make a phone call. So I think that, that, that what you've told us is really important for, um, I'm head of Russian and Slavic studies here at the University of Arizona. Chinese or Mandarin, just like um, um, Russian, just like Arabic, are, is one of these less commonly taught languages that falls into the critical needs languages um, in the United States. And uh, we're finding terrible shortages of Russian language teachers, too. So this is highly interesting for me. Um, I know that uh, you have a wonderful 
um, opportunity and support from the Chinese government, and and that isn't available um, to you know all less commonly taught languages. Um, and I guess uh, I have one question and then sort of another question. One question is, do you foresee this as sort of being a bridge between um, uh, providing more teachers, American teachers, to sort of carry the, the torch within the next 10, 15 years or so, or, or do you see this as ongoing? And number two, um, probably every state has different, maybe even every city has different rules for their, um, t we're, we're having, so we can't get a Russian language teacher, for example, emergency certified in Tucson. They have to be certified teachers already, being able to teach these um, less commonly taught languages. So that that's a huge issue, and I'm just wondering how that worked in these places that you were able to really make inroads. So much, Terry, for the two <clears throat> very important questions. Number one, the Chinese Hanba has already realized by constantly sending guest teachers is not a solution to long-term uh, stability. So they are highly encouraging training local teachers, including those citizens or green card holders, H1 holders from China, to teach Chinese here because they won't have visa issue. And so that we have moved from uh, sending more guest teachers to training more localized teachers. And that is a market for lots of foreign language programs to set up a MA degree program, professional degree program for Texel. And also I feel those once they have the certificate of degrees, they will be able to find jobs because there is a market there. So that is uh, my answer to your first question. And the second question, could you rephrase the Okay, I got it, yes. So how can we give, uh, certify these guest teachers to teach? It's always a challenge for each state because you need a teacher certification. So lots of states, uh, they have a conditional certificate and the College of Education will work with the Department of Education in each, each state. And there is a movement through the College Board and Asia Society to align different states together to accept you know, the, the training module. So if Hanban teachers receive the training acknowledged by College Board or Asia Society, they could be equivalent to a state-specific certificate to resolve this issue. And there are lots of states, uh, I believe in New York, Connecticut, and Kentucky, they already uh, have the uh, green light to do that. But I, I think it's still a challenge. Yes, Heidi. In conjunction with doing a perspectives column that was looking at the whole business of, of teacher, uh, getting the best teachers, and there were two contributors to that column in the MLJ uh, that looked at that, and one of them specifically on the issue of um, the Chinese teachers here, and the other co contributor looked at how this is handled across the country, the very question that you posed. You might find that column interesting. Um, I find curious, um, I understand why, but I still find curious uh, that you chose a liaison with the college board because it seems to me that the very point you made at the end with some of your recommendations, namely that you need to be closer to the ground, um, would seem to make uh, places uh, offices, institutions, places, whatever you want to call them, like the foreign language supervisors in the states who have the reach into the districts, the better places to go. And Kentucky, of course, is an example of that because Jackie Van Houten has been one of the prime movers and has looked at that issue uh, across the world because the same issues occur with importing Spanish teachers, the same issues occur with importing 
Russian teachers, and on and on and on. And since they're closer to the ground and, of course, know what the state regulations are and have, in most cases, reasonably good connections to their district-level supervisors, that might be one way to tie in your teachers because, clearly, they are left out in the wilderness and have no supervision whatsoever, while most school districts, of course, have some mechanism that takes their incoming teachers, some of them have extraordinary mechanisms. And the perspectives column actually spoke of those where I took some of the top school districts in the country that do really, really good work with that. And it might be useful to consider that as one way as you are transitioning into your new system to give them a support structure because clearly they need that. So that's just a comment. Uh, Will the boss? Oh, no, no, sorry. <laughs> the Robin the Robinson, uh, Wilbur Robinson from uh, from uh, Ohio, and these people are all on the advisory board, and they work directly with the Chinese language program program in Asia Society. Yeah, and that's, that's a connection. That's what I hope to like yes, that. you have the connection, and they these are the key people because they are supervising each different state, and also uh, as a result of the Confucius. Uh, Institute, they are all at a university level. So parallelly, there are more than one, uh, there are about 100 Confucius classrooms. And uh, so the Asia Soci Society language, Chinese language program are working with uh, Confucius classrooms. So they will each have a partner school in China or partner university in China to support their initiative to provide more resources.